Hello everyone, today we talk about Islamic Anatolian warfare from the 11th to the 14th century as a general introduction. We made already some videos about the Anatolian Seljuks uh, that weren't actually the only um, Islamic powers existing uh, in, in the region, right? We will now define the boundaries better, but as you know there were other dynasties such as the uh, Danish Mendids and the Karamanids, but the most peculiar characteristic of this land is its frontier nature, even after centuries of Islamic conquest during this period, you know, we begin with Manzikar, but, you know, things had been going on, and they would keep going on, um, not just because the Byzantines would be able, after that battle, until Mario Kefal, and in theory, like, if the Empire had not succumbed to the Crusaders, even after that, to recover, by that point, literally, like, almost the entirety of Anatolia, this is notorious as sort of inexplicably um, underappreciated as general historical uh, acknowledgement, but also the the West, and in that there are different dimensions, like the, the Pontic one, the Caucasian one, we, we looked at Jazirian warfare at Syria, recently about um, Chilich and Armenia, and more. Today we stopped at the 14th century, but you know that the Westerners, even after the loss of the Holy Land, actually stayed around, right? And they controlled some important parts of the, um, especially of the Aegean, um, and uh, as such, like the early um, Ottoman power, like would would um, would emerge as a competitor. Sometimes, however, even as as, as a sponsor of the same Westerners. Um, there is today we do not talk, of course, even about the, the Tatar um, invaded Timurid invasion, but we will, however, try to appreciate the influence of Western warfare in Islamic Anatolia that, in fact, has surprisingly Western, properly European um, influence in its warfare. Unlike, in fact, uh, most of the surround, like the, the List. It, it does, like we have found the same Western influence um, here and there. It's one of actually the major um, influxes in the development of local warfare. But for Islamic and Anatolia, this is particularly pronounced, aside from the strong uh, Persian uh, influence that especially the Seljuk and Anatolians maintained. Um, then the Mamluks, the two rose at some point, the Mongols, the from the same Persia, just as the uh, Seljuks like had emerged like as the, the main regional um, power in the east, uh, would keep, um, uh, e in fact, influenced, but being influenced by the same also previous cultures. So let's let's try to to get this step by step. So um, Islamic Anatolia is synonym with Rum, right? Um, that is essentially the the Arabic name for Rome, right? It's the idea that Islamic Anatolia was fundamentally the land of the Romans, and as such, like the Turks uh, that settled in the area, at least that created the mostly also in a not necessarily just in a dynastic fashion because there were different war bands, etc. But as at at least as at the heads, like as properly the Sel branch of the Seljuk um, dynasty would come to rule in this place, is considered themselves to be ruling over what was, say, Rome in a universally conceptual fashion. This is the same reason why the Ottomans, that incidentally actually emerged from the same context, uh, will have notoriously as um, Caesars of Rome. Uh, among their their title, their official universal ecumenic titles, right? And it wasn't just say boasting, like of course something that they couldn't quite um, replicate in the essentials that, that Romanity had had been, but it, it was still metaphysically felt as here we are the guys who took over the, the Roman people proper, right? It's a bit the same reason why the say eventually that the Ottonians. Uh, after having reaffirmed much of the, the previous Carolingian imperial power, called themselves ethnically Romans. And, and this is incredibly important to stress as an adverb, because otherwise 
one does not understand what would had been the metaphysically transfigurational role of the Roman people in the view of these others coming later um, there would be lots of connections and this was true for the Turks towards the same Romans so that of course became uh, also most of the basis of, of the population that, that eventually the, the Ottoman Empire but also this Islamic Anatolian one um, it was about this had been lands of the Romans for ages right so fundamentally they were very uh, say Greek culturally and uh, linguistically uh, and more think about the the Rumelia later and how essentially you have there a substitution literally of the of the Byzantine power with the Ottoman one and on this broader um, in fact Byzantine population rather than you know, in fact, Roman in a say other than a, this traditional sense was really pushing away um, the, the Roman Church at that point. They preferred essentially the the, the Islamic Turks. Um, uh, that, that's another real story that in fact is not so stressed um, enough. And but this is not a positive thing, right? Just to say how bad the Roman Church was. But no, it, it's it's a single you know an, an unequivocal tragedy. Uh, for of course also what happened to the Balkans later on in history but coming back on the other side of of the Bosphorus of course this um, land say let's call it the ex-Byzantine regions of Anatolia um, that were conquered by the Seljuks and their successors during the 11th century constitute the focus of today's day um, so by the late 11th century um, so after the Battle of Manzikert, but before the arrival of the First Crusade um, and the Komnenian reconquest of the western third of Anatolia, I have a video incoming on Alexis the First, by the way, um, and I have made the ones about John II, about Emmanuel, etc., so that you can appreciate also the progression, but this in fact happened after the First Crusade. Rome um, included, let's say, the, the wall of what is today's modern Asian Turkey, fundamentally, except for the Black Sea coast from the Bosphorus up to the Georgian frontier. I made a video about Georgian warfare if you're interested. You know, the series is conceived regionally so that you can switch from region to region and seeing all the influences from one another and they are discussed all in a sort of homogeneous level of, um, of criticism and analysis. Um, Rome excluded Armenia historically as well as the Jazeera. Um, doesn't matter how much the Byzantines had at some point controlled part of these regions, right? I discussed recently Armenian and Jazeera warfare for this same series, so that is also uh, the thing. Like before Manzikert, that's the reason also why Alperslan went on fighting. Like from from Syria, it was literally the westernmost um, stretch of let's say a, a united sort of Seljuk imperial control. Um, that was very stretched. Like from from Persia, went up to uh, like the um, the Euphrates Valley and arrived in uh, near to Lake Van um, in Armenia because the Byzantines had basically aimed at invading the same Jazeera from the north had they kept expanding as they had been doing in depth like in the in the Armenian frontier proper so that when you look at eventually what happens after Manzikert you realize that yes Armenia was lost together with this interior part of the Anatolian frontier by the way it was very fortified like it was very Roman in nature yes admittedly it was like from a Constantinopolitan perspective still pretty far away but as you know Anatolia as a whole was in part also because of its slightly wilder nature especially in the central plateaus the sea of the essentially the Takmata cavalry uh, manpower and also horsepower um, that uh, was lost uh, with the uh, Turkish conquest that also brought to a disintegration essentially of the internal um, Byzantine administrative system at least to, to the degree it had been controlled like in a sort of statal fashion for example this was a fairly fertile area at least the Byzantines 
like since antiquity had been carrying out an important level of irrigation, there were widely far, fertile areas. After the Islamic conquest, this thing was uh, re-desertified by some extent and um, turned into, say, Central Asian pastoralism, um, in part because still the cornerstone of the local dominance were these important continental cities that uh, ended up in the hands of, of the Turks that, however, were effectively ruling on truly Roman, like Byzantine communities in, in that, and so inheriting even in part the local militia systems, etc. We've seen it for the same, in the same relation towards the uh, the Syrians, for example, when the the and other Levantine uh, peoples, when in fact the Seljuks took over the Holy Land, etc. Like th there was always a continuity, especially in the city urban militia system that was somewhat developed at, at this point, especially in in the lab, say in yeah in places like Syria, not too much in places like Anatolia, telling the truth, but it it's essentially the Turks drafting themselves um, over this system. And plus there is, yes, other peoples, Turks, let's say, that come from as far away as Central Asia. Because again, the bulk of uh, the Seljuks at this point was de facto the Iranian plateau. But, you know, that, that was a gateway for the injection of various, like... Um, peoples from literally everywhere. But do not underestimate, for, as we will see now, so the influence of Caucasus, of the Pontic steppes, in the, probably in the replenishment of the manpower, or let's say, so in, probably in the settlement of new uh, inhabitants into Anatolia, right? When we look at the height of the Byzantine revival in the region, we are in the mid-12th century, and the Islamic room had been uh, shrinking from the modern Turkish provinces of Malatya in the east to Iphon in the west and Amasya in the north to Konya in the south. Um, Rum is also known as the Sultanate of Iconium because Konya was the most important city and it sort of had this provincial power that hegemonized the other uh, Baylor base, we will see it, this other uh, emirates um, uh, in the in the rest of the plateau, this was reflective, of course, of the degree of relative decentralization. I mean, at least the collapse of the Byzantine state. That, of course, before the collapse was not really centralized, like I don't know, in, back in in Roman times, say in antiquity. That also was not so centralized as we think in the first place. But definitely, like the Turks had had problems themselves in managing the uh, the political organization of, of the region because it was sort of like uh, like just a collapse like the conquest the war etc had significantly depleted also the local resources so uh, then you have other polities in the meanwhile um, for example the mountainous eastern parts of Anatolia were ruled by the aforementioned Danish Mandate dynasty that would actually be absorbed um, in the end, by the Seljuks of Rumor slash Konya, uh, that in fact had most of the central Anatolian plateau position and sort of the most uh, strategically sound, rightable. But don't think that the Turks had the upper hand on on the Byzantines. Like uh, the the continental parts of, of of the country were, of course, less developed compared to the to the coastline that, as we've seen, re remained essentially in Byzantine control and had historically a different um, outlook. And in fact, um, a few people noted, even af after the Battle of Myriokephalon, for years after the battle, uh, that is normally credited just simply as a, as a Byzantine disaster, uh, the same economy was evacuated. Uh, like, the Byzantines were still dangerous to that point, um, and uh, and the war would just conclude itself by exhaustion later on, right? So it's very fascinating that Manuel Comnenus and uh, the, the 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 ruler of, of Econium sent to Frederick Barbarossa at the same time, like the 
the, their own missives, each, each own saying, ah, oh, we are winning and the enemy is losing, like this kind of uh, stuff. But it's, um, in fact, it, it is really a frontier. It is really an era where it's difficult, even for the Byzantines or conquer it to, to centralize to, to an important degree. Those times were just, as we will see now, ones of rampant uh, feudalization, say, or quasi feudalization and privatization in also the Byzantine and the Islamic world. Because there were also lots of Westerners involved, as we will see. Um, the Sultanate of Rum did not really um, have much expansionistic potential, like aside from these other Islamic groups that we've seen here, like dynasties. Like there was no chance to really dislodge the the Byzantines to conquer m much uh, further territory. All right, they the the Turks did take control of sections of the Black Sea and Mediterranean coastlines, uh, which were in fact one of their most important strategic objectives, like arriving to the sea, having enough, like, let's say, connections with, with the outer world and sort of uh, putting in crisis the, the, the same Byzantine communication along the same coast. I mean, as long as the interland was not reconquered, the Byzantines had difficulty for example, just to reestablish any uh, a continental connection between the various cities on the coast, so that they would take sort on some sort of maritime centrifugal um, character, like Trebizond, for example, as far as the Black Sea is concerned. Um, Smyrna was also very important um, in this game. The Meander Valley, etc. These are places like where the the Byzantines and the, I don't know the the Catalans uh, used against the Turks. We would always be fighting against the the Muslims. I made a video about the, the battle of Antioch on the Meander. Uh, it's an old re-upload, and perhaps I should have added more pictures, but say, at least that is done and saved. Um, there was, um, in fact, in the 13th century, that's in fact the strategic and political context uh, I mentioned the battle for, where you can see well, of course, that that basically Byzantines at that point did not quite exist as the uh, superpower that they had been up to um, a few generations before, and so this uh, their fragmentation, the Kong, the Latin Empire, had brought to a much greater, so not necessarily greater Turkish pressure, but uh, surely like a greater ease for the Turks to to reach the the sea. Right. In fact, the Turks themselves had been invested by the Mongols, and that had been the major factor all over, including the injection of further, um, as we will see now from the composition of of the local armies, like of this rabble from from the steppe that had always kept pouring, like in the Islamic world, from uh, from those places, but. And then at this point was also settling, nesting, etc. After like properly the collapse of the of important states like the Caliphate one, the, the Byzantine one, after literally like you know centuries and centuries of stability of some form. So again, all these are good ideas for other videos, but we can't simply um, stop contemplating them. There is a lot to do. Um, so, and, and after this, basically, the same Sultanate of Rum was, was no more. Like, there was a fragmentation into numerous dynasties, petty dynasties, as a matter of fact, that take the name from either, like, as Emirates or Balix. The, the etymology is, is different. Uh, Amir comes from the Arab, it means properly military commander, right, within the caliphal uh, role, right, a, a merely military function, while the, or, or office, where the Beylik is a Turkic word which means, like, tribal leader, so uh, they weren't really different, like, in practice from, and that's why they're inter interchangeable in this context, but at least the, the etymology is slightly different if you, if you read this from some source and just be mindful of their etymology and semantics. So these Turkish principalities, albeit small, 
uh, were capable of enfeebling uh, the Byzantines with a renovated um, force. They were part at this point of a world that had in part existed, had in part like uh, existed in a metaphysical sense in the especially southeastern borders of Anatolia because those were the places where historically all these scum from all the various heterodox sects of Islam had taken refuge in mountainous areas in a sort of again again pr primitive wild territories that had always been the sea of of um, pretty uh, sort of rude um, and tough um, mountaineer populations that would keep cultivating this sort of more heterodox but also in the sense more vibrant violent aggressive um, properly religious sects hence we call these part of these principalities as at least the the Gazi states uh, Gazi is a is a term that refers to both I mean meaningfully enough both um, a holy warrior right and um, in the um, raider right a, a looter of some sort right and the armies of Islam had always especially the ones that had made large use of Turkic mercenaries always but not only um, just always had this sort of rabble again surrounding the core startle forces and coming from from everywhere it's it's a broader reason in part stems from the uh, semi-nomadism of, of the Arabs at the beginning then again the, the Turkic Gulams play the, the greater role but it's also about the, the, the political and social structures of Islam right the general lack of some sort of um, safeguard mechanisms like everything is in, in the hand both uh, religiously and and uh, politically to the fact the theory to God but this of course materializing in the earthly authority towards which in fact there is a chronic distrust and Islam is much more fragmented but by far uh, disproportionately um, to Christendom and this allows this war band sort of to, to thrive as we will see now with other forms of quasi military order associations that hadn't been we've seen it for the for the uh, Almoravids, the Almohads in um, in Spain, in Morocco, like the uh, Murabitun, the, uh, the Murabid. Um, and here there is something similar, except with some sort of wilder step flavor of sort. Um, these polities were really, you know, trying to knock each other out, but it did contribute also to a relatively unitary fort in this provincial direction and another so that gradually again the, the Byzantine territories were eroded. Very different situation from just Syria where the Mamluks had um, you know taken control of the Syria. Par and partly actually the Mamluks would enter Anatolia as well but this area would always remain frontier. Right. So by the early 14th century uh, the Byzantines had been all but evicted from Anatolia, practically just one of the bailiffs with a land frontier contiguous to, uh, to Constantinople proper, um, and not counting the Empire of Trebizond that literally called itself um, out there. So it would be, in fact, it would fall in in the 60s of the 15th century to to the Ottomans, even after Constantinople passed on the Black Sea coast um, and the um, the closest of these Beyliks to Constantinople was the nascent Ottoman state right the Ottomans are emerging in the by far most westernized and Romanized of all these Turkic territories right and this makes you think really in the uh, like considering the the measure in, in fact in which the Ottomans would display some especially compared to the Persians the Mamluks some, some Western features right even though their their armies were somehow very um, very much influenced by the 
like the Turkish tradition, but also the simply the um, the Mongol one at this point. There were other Beyleks that had taken instead the way of the sea, right? This had created some headache uh, to uh, the Westerners at the beginning, like they, they could, the, the Europeans would easily suppress these pirates, but they were so nested into this uh, Anatolian coastline now that they were a constantly annoying presence. It's only after the Ottomans would create properly a real navy that things would change, but there is this extra burden uh, the West has to pay for the collapse of, uh, of the Byzantine Empire. But again, these pirates are also pretty like that. That's what they remain essentially throughout this time. Now, the first Islamic raiders that back in the 11th century had penetrated the Byzantine uh, frontier of Anatolia were actually not Turks. In some cases, they were not even Muslims. Right, the majority of them seems to have been Kurdish, together with other uh, essentially Persian groups. Uh, the, for example, the Dailamis that I discussed in that video about um, Jaziran warfare. If I'm not wrong, because this was a population that, uh, albeit very uh, old style, still is foot based in a world that was already actually full of. Uh, say Turkic uh, gulams on horseback but that was extremely aggressive and successful and was hired as far as Egypt um, and far and wide in, in, the, in the Middle East um, and uh, these guys would exploit in fact the collapse of the Byzantine frontier but really they had already this is yet the other point is that these groups had all had been penetrating uh, the Byzantine border from quite a long time Right. We've seen it also with the Armenians to an extent that they, as they were more managed by the Byzantines in moving um, into Chilicia, but in fact had always been also hired by, by the Byzantines as mercenaries for, for centuries. So there is a lot of, um, we see, of pressure, of traffic, if you want, volume of people that are moving and that want to enter, in fact, uh, Anatolia. Uh, while the Byzantine Empire can manage this to an extent also because part of this people would be absorbed the were um, important uh, manpower as in fact the the, Ar the proportions of the Armenian uh, element in the Byzantine army also shows um, however after Manzikert those who established really a state like the the one of Iconium, were Turkoman leaders, right? These were barely under the control of the great Seljuk sultans of Iran that were de facto the, the real Seljuk power. Like, knowingly, the Seljuks conquered far and wide everything, like, in the Middle East and beyond. But, concretely, at the end of the day, they, they were just installing themselves dynastically in different places. The only true heartland, like, was... It was not even, in fact, the Turkic one was was Persia, All right? Uh, we'll talk more about them at some point. Um, so the the, the Turkomans were surely also the ones that under uh, uh, Alparslan broke properly the the Byzantines uh, at Manzikert. Even that was not the immense disaster that we usually think it, it really was from a tactical point of view. It, it was mostly like the, the long-term uh, political and strategical consequences. Uh, those were the guys who sort of shepherded all these other peoples and or imposed themselves on them um, further west. Uh, so that's the state of Rome was, was established. Uh, the army, like that of the rival Danish man that of Eastern Anatolia was primarily made up of uh, nomadic Turkomans, tribal warriors which installed themselves now in a relatively desolated Anatolia, this one that had been heavily um, pillaged and in part depopulated, etc. So in some cases they could, the, the local terrain was sort of suitable 
for making them continue the, the lifestyle that had had in Central Asia to some extent. Um, this is relevant because, of course, the cities were important, but the majority of, of the land had to be settled with some sort of soldiery, and these guys were under, the, of course, the clientele of, of the sultans, of these guys living in palaces, having uh, permanent armies, etc., were the, let's say, the, the final rank horsemen, the backbone, if you want, of the same uh, Seljuk armies, and the Anatolian Seljuk ones. Then there would be this other group, so you will see actually a multitude of different ethnicities as far as the Caucasus or, or the Rus that would be employed. All right. um, the Turkoman backbone remained pretty much um, unaltered until the early 13th century, um, when, as we will see now, there, there would be a more professional permanent soldiery uh, establishing itself mostly around like in the retinues of, of the of the single sultans but also something more you know um, structured at, at a local level in terms of levies and armor organization uh, there was also a matter of ethnic assimilation I mean the the, the Turkomans did settle in these areas but the majority of the population was not Turkish Also, in the later Middle Ages, however, the Turkomans kept representing a major source of military manpower. And again, these guys could come from quite far away, keeping to do so, especially as the area became more uh, unstable, right? After um, the, the Mongol invasions, like, there was really a power vacuum, and this, this say, Anatolia was not ruled really by a major state like the the sultanate of rule had been so it's a very um dynamic but still also sort of backward area between the the Ilkhanate, uh the timurids later on and the mamluks and uh essentially the what, what had been left of, of the byzantines plus the other sort of as we'll see external influences that kept uh, arriving it was especially the Mongol invasion that sort of revived the importance of the Turkoman element in Anatolia just by lifestyle presumably many people who had once belonged to sanitary farmers had uh, during the, the conquest, the crisis, whatever passed to this kind of more nomad, semi-nomadic lifestyle just by imitation. This is very common. You can see it also in Eastern Europe. Many of the small beyliks that we see in the later period are essentially fueled as powers by the, the war bands where you have Turkomans that are still uh, tour around. From the mid 12th to the mid 13th century, there was, however, uh, as we were saying before, an important uh, military development within uh, the Anatolian Seljuk military system that resembled, like, sort of the more uh, statally oriented uh, ones. There was an Iranian influence. The say the medieval Persia had began, in spite of its uh, important private sort of feudal nature, to consolidate more, more stable structures. In fact, also the the Mongols would make use of these for their for their army. And also, uh, less subtly, a Byzantine influence that had always remained, like at the root of the local military organization, especially the, the levies, right, the higher, like, system that had allowed the Byzantines to levy field armies, of course, had collapsed together with, with the conquest of, um, of Anatolia, but there were lots of wars, lots of just 
very practical, so some universal, like sort of shared, obvious sanitary uh, systems that now the Turks were simply integrating in their own uh, much more predatory and unstable system. Uh, now that they were installing themselves as leaders of cities and, in fact, mingling with the, with the local population. The degree of Byzantine influence in the Sultanate of Rome is also a matter of debate, because, of course, there wasn't like an enormous Byzantine face, uh, if not, as we'll see now, in some aspects of material culture, uh, etc. But there is definitely in the 13th century, starting from the beginning, um, um, an important development in the local military administration, which again doesn't mean tactics or equipment that are necessarily similar to the Byzantine ones, but still something that looks more like in the direction of a state, something more sophisticated. Again, this was the peak of medieval civilization, there were important resources available in this territory that controlled some important trade routes, it had a major strategic um, relevance in the balance between the Byzantines, the, the Crusaders, like the, the other powers around. Um, we see, for example, um, plenty of Byzantine soldiers and other Greek prisoners of war that are enlisted in the uh, Seljuk armies. We see, evidently, communities of mixed Greek and Turkish descent. The, the concept of Turkopol, which in Greek means the child of Turk, even though it's sort of more from the, from the western side of the story, because the Turks would have not, would have said it in a different way, um, is um, sort of, however, the physical and tactical representation of that. I made a video about the Turkopoles, and especially the Sultanate of Rome was very much more Western uh, in, in, in its basis, right, for, in fact, pre-existing Byzantine, but also later Western influences would be noticeable there. The Sultanate of Rome army reached its peak by the mid-13th century. It had distinct sections, for example, the tribal Turkomans. And then it would be, so the, again, this was the numerical backbone of the, of the army, like the one that would also go in the, at war in the, in the field armies proper, the militia was available, surely also in larger numbers, but they, they were not particularly qualitative or just to keep to to go out by even just inclination. The, the elite Gulam slave soldiers were, were really the core of the Anatolian Seljuk armies, right? Many or most of the latter were freed on the completion of their military training. It was a sort of more liberal way of treating the average Gulam, right? Uh, like uh, the Mamluks, except they, in this case, they would retain sort of a, they would acquire a freer status earlier. And likely because the system was less startle, right? For a Mamluk to remain a Mamluk in Egypt, for example, was a privilege, right? Uh, here, being freed mostly means like, okay, I have enough power as a state to, to keep you under my control as long as um, you complete your, your training, then you're free because of that. And this shows less coercive capacity for sure. In the sense, it's interesting because you know that the Egyptian armies were much more Western looking, even though they were sort of less Western influenced than, especially in this case, the Sultanate of Rule. The Turks had sort of more cavalry, the, the Egyptians had more infantry forces. But we will see it better step by step in each video discussing the relative topics. Um, there were some 
horsemen performing military service specifically in return for lands or fiefs. This was the Icta, was pretty much known as a political and social other than just military system it, all over the Islamic world essentially was the 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 Muslim version of the Byzantine pranoya, right? Something like we can't call it feudalism, it wasn't for the fact that it was much less intense uh, and codified and sort of uh, systematic than how the, the Westerners were going at it. There were local mercenaries that were also passing by just uh, in this important Anatolian crossroad. I made a video about the Western European, or properly Frankish, mercenaries. There are some um, uh, sources like showing very, as we'll see now, Western-looking forces, and we may think that these were literally like Western Europeans hired to fight in the Seljuk. Um, state which was not so stigmatized like fighting for say um the mamluks like because these uh, anatolian guys were sort of different they were not this huge threat um uh, especially starting from the 13th century and uh, the, the 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 political allegiance for for that was sort of much um more flexible there were, of course, allied contingents of sort from different groups. We know of even some Byzantine emperors were raised, actually, at uh, Iconium, at the Islamic court. Uh, it's a complicated stuff. Some of the claims to the, to the rule of the Byzantine Empire would derive uh, from the fact that some Byzantines had properly married into, um, like, had married... Uh, fact princesses from the sultanate of Rome, and so there were um, quite mixed breeds even at an imperial uh, level the sultanial level so that that's quite fascinating the Comnenians had such connections uh, at a point for example we, if we look at the uh, equipment of the most important the, the elite probably the the quality backbone of the Anatolian Seljuk army the Gulams, these really had pretty much the same panoply, aside from sort of different style, local styles, from the Gulams and Mamluks of other Middle Eastern Islamic states. Right, the finest panoplies in Anatolia resembled pretty much the Persian ones, because that was essentially the say the the state that more influenced culturally as to, to the Seljuk channel uh, Anatolian warfare right and generally speaking like uh, they, they were dominating as far as the this feudal uh, nomadic uh, semi-nomadic equipment would um, was concerned so technologically it's sort of like the, the Seljuks were the dominant uh, the gold standard for, for the for the Islamic forces in the Middle East. So they would, in, in Anatolia, they would uh, imitate that. There was, however, as we, we will see now more in, in detail, a, an enormous load of Byzantine or even Western European influence in arms and armor. Among the many mercenaries that you could find in Anatolia during this centuries, the Georgians were the most prominent right um, you're talking in relative terms then you would have the the Turks of the most different however tribal or geographical origins some people coming literally as far as central even Eastern Asia like we have no idea just when the major campaigns started like these guys that were already roaming around were attracted by the loot um, and they would simply join a bit like the Gazis that we've seen just accepted the latter normally uh, were sort of more locally um, stable uh, polities you would have Rusians, Arabs Greeks, Armenians Quaresmians 
Pechenegs, Kurds, Dailamis, and other Persians, like so an incredibly large amount um, of peoples that really reflects how sort of you know high the um, you know the demand for troops was in this area but not necessarily f for the local capacity of hiring them but for the one of the neighboring states right and the quite tumultuous uh, situation that existed in d during the Crusades in the region again the there is not really any hegemonic state like the Byzantine Empire you know after Manzikert it is incredibly solid and centralized and uh, even the, the crusader states are sort of very well connected they have they import like western feudalism independently from how uh, they they eventually fared like it, the the broader Levant and the Middle East was much more messed up in terms of political control than, than we think right and, and again I made videos about Syrian Jazirian warfare we'll have to see Persia we talk extensively about Caucasus about the Chilean and Armenian so many different cultures peoples religions confessions um, and what strikes you the most perhaps about this all is that there, there were lots of Europeans in the Levant as free agents, right? Free contractors, we can say. Um, we're talking about French, German, and maybe even Italian knights, mostly coming from the Crusader states and the Latin Empire, but also literally from like the outer West, we can so say. This is no surprise, really. We've seen the Ilkhanate of Persia using. Uh, Italian crossbowmen in the Indian Ocean, right? Um, the Byzantines themselves had been and were keeping to use lots of Western uh, Akritai and other mercenaries, uh, trying to replicate Western European uh, feudalism, which is something again I discussed, especially in the video about Manuel the First Comnenus. And that had been, generally speaking, done by, by other peoples that during the, the process of, let's say, Frankization, such as Poland or Hungary, right? You find really uh, knights coming from all over Western Europe to settle further east. Um, this, this is evident also, as we'll see now, in Arms and Armor. There were surely some... Uh, local imitations of Western weapons, not just the injection by these mercenaries. This in Europe, this goes very far east, as we've seen in the videos about the Rus, Poland. Um, and as we were saying before, there was less stigma on those Westerners that decided to fight for the Sultanate of Rum or, you know, any other uh, Anatolian uh, Islamic power uh, than the ones who would as there were like would serve instead Syria or Egypt right sometimes they were mercenaries uh, I mean excuse me prisoners of war that were just even remaining there we've seen it in the video about the siege of Acre uh, this is something that happened to some of the uh, the captives of the crusade the Christian resistance there um, but it was really an open market of western knights western soldiers in general uh in especially again in the in anatolia the revival of the turkomans following to the crisis of the sultanate of rome surely had to do with the mongol backing and so the uh revitalization of those typically Central Asian harassment horse archers and this is true for every level of equipment again the Mongols have an enormous influence on the sort of re um, stepization part of the of even the fringes of European warfare we've seen it for example for Eastern Balkan warfare 
um, the Byzantines telling the truth since the 11th century had basically privatized entirely their uh, almost entirely their army and uh, like the outrage horse archer was some you know Pechenik from from the from the Pontic steps right so this was just happening together with the further privatization and feudalization that occurs during the 13th especially in the 14th century and all this disintegration of, of the, from the, the bigger Mongolian Empire to these other um, sultanates that during the High Middle Ages had somehow uh, stood on their feet in spite of the fact that they were not really states like the the ancient caliphal ones, let's say, of uh, a Roman or Sasanian inspiration, right? Uh, but even in their feudal element, were sort of state-like. Um, there was a residual capacity, of course, of the local governments to maintain a uh, statal force. Um, there is not, uh, however, so much support uh, to a centralized system. Right? That's why also these uh, tour commands are resettled to a degree, because they they were just coming knowing of the broader crisis and so that there was less policing uh, weaker authority and they could simply also carve their own scenery somewhere in the room um, but in fact it was easy and sort of cheap to to hire these guys rather than trying to keep standing some sort of permanent system of sort the general profile and potential of these Anatolian states after the disintegration of the Seljuk one uh, is evident again in their tactics, in their, for example, maintenance of certain light, so in allegedly traditional but sort of functional and you know available um, panoply features like hardened leather armor, right? But and this is quite interesting the basis on which the Turkish power starts sort of regrowing more slowly of course um, in the late Middle Ages are the cities like specifically urban militias that were not quite again the see the Turks never had that sort of true like a, a communal spirit or whatever like they had just come to rule over these centers they had a court they they had the, the local Byzantine population largely living as they had done before. Uh, and without, as you know, also in Byzantine society, much dynamism in the first place, at least compared to the West. Um, so you don't have like those um, commonly based forces. But you have something else. That is to say, some spiritual brotherhoods known as Fithian, uh, owing... Uh, allegiance to a broader code, the Futuva, which um, in Arab ha means um, the, the youth like to rejuvenate, right? It's the idea of belonging, it's the old ecumenic like war band uh, idea. Like, if you are part of these brotherhoods, you have a transcendental capacity of um, rejuvenating, right? Of uh, inverting the trend of the fall. So, these were. Um, say there were similar systems as we've seen both in the Christian and in the Islamic world but the role that they played in this regional context was really really interesting because for example they were at the basis of the early military development of the early Ottoman state I made lots of videos about late medieval Ottoman armies also for the 14th century that is not like the, the most uh, popularized phase, um, or at least that is just the, the phase from which you start the story and then most of the info starts arriving from the 15th and the peak being the 16th, etc. The rest uh, being smoother sailing in terms of documentation. Uh, and that is important to instead root exactly in this post Seljuk times and the way the uh, Anatolian communities had been organizing themselves, militarily speaking. Right, we see, of course, this uh, say Fithian uh, in different Baliks, um, 
it's interesting that these are especially located in the let's say either on the Byzantine frontier or uh, uh, at sea like so in a sort of properly more, more active area of expansion so these fraternities were sort of boosting that sort of holy war spirit um, in the uh, during the, the struggle this overlaps with the concept of the Gazi state considered that after the great Seljuks had collapsed lots of Turkomans had migrated west uh, to find employment plus we see the Fithian locally right uh, there were another name was Ahis right and the, all this force like all this conglomeration managed even though there wasn't at the beginning a particularly rigid military system again now we will see how the Ottomans try in fact to fix it because it was no statal professional one right but it it managed to erode further as you know the Byzantine territory to swarm into the Balkans and to therefore mm, test the um, so the just the resistance of the local communities there are different things going on to, today we stop essentially through the second half of the 14th century um, but you know that the battle of Nicopolis is, is, is near etc so we will talk about this and I again already made other videos on Ottoman warfare that explain in part what was going on after this period um, so um, we're seeing a very hybrid Turkish Byzantine military culture right this is evident also in the revival of the 13th century especially in Western Anatolia naturally was the most Byzantine uh, in nature much of this process was favored naturally by the frontier nature of the land especially in fact in this west part so the obvious hybrid that occurs when say two cultures are fighting against one another but also and especially the fact that say the, the, the no man's land uh, nature of the same area right that uh, favored thus also the like much of these actions were just brigandage right they were not just easily um, uh, fit in a in a broader struggle the Byzantines in these places were not that picky uh, religiously speaking they accepted this also you know Islamic forces they were flexible in their allegiances for different reasons like it's not that they liked the Muslims uh, or anyone like the typical uh, Byzantine xenophobia was very constitutively part of their of their identity but they so like different opportunities at different time both uh, before and after the fourth crusade it is exactly within this context that the Ottomans rise to power never made a video about the very origins of the Osmanian dynasty and state like much of it is actually legion uh, these were as you can expect not particularly well documented times and places and sort of the rise of, of the Ottomans was sort of uh, relatively fast but exactly for this reason like very um, let's say nobody thought that this would become the, the, the largest power around in a few uh, in a few generations right um, by the early 14th century we can see however in the Ottoman military organization certain features that would go on for for centuries right in 1326 uh, the Ottomans conquered Bursa in Bithynia this was a major city on the Marmara Sea and so with really just many of the advantages that just in, in front of Constantinople practically um, which helped the Osmanians to develop a regular army somewhat early on right um, for example the um, legion at least says that it's from the capture of Bursa that the uh, Ottomans established the Janitseri the uh, new militia which it technically means even though it 
likely happened later under Murad I from some prisoners of war that were taken after the fall of Edirne um, uh, in 1361. In any case, uh, the uh, basis of Ottoman power were laid um, at that point to grow further. Proportionally to the resources of the state, by the way, the Ottoman army was pretty large, possibly because of the intensity of the Byzantine resistance. Uh, this is just like now a speculation. We should study more in depth, like the, actually the very complicated process through which this all uh, happened. In any case, the Ottomans that obviously had as the main strategic objective the conquest of Constantinople, um, as much as it was the political one, I mean, you get Constantinople, you get the, the golden apple, it's all the, you know, the entire thing. And uh, the, the, the the red one, actually, is the the Turks the went. Um, the army was subdivided into three uks, uk in, in Turk, um, that would be something like frontier areas and some marches. Right, and these were essentially established in the advance towards, say, and along the Black Sea coast, towards its mid and its neck, that in fact would become the centers of such hooks, respectively. And uh, the Ottomans eventually again uh, invaded European mainland, and three similar hooks were established facing north and the northwest. Um, this was the bridge hand that allowed the Ottomans to swarm into the Balkans. There was some mm, absorption, of course, of all what had been the still present Byzantine uh, military system in all this. For example, the Akritai, that were, as you know, these um, de facto castellans right of, uh, along the frontier. Some, some were sort of more like um lower peasant soldiers of some sort they had a mm, uh, a pronoia system basically of military and land tenure well all this was gradually absorbed by the ottomans in their conquest of anatolia and uh, you can imagine literally all the people who remained there and that as we've seen had already been fighting for the turks so you can imagine again all the most random stories of people just of european descent that had uh, or Western European descent specifically that remained eventually there and sort of at some point converted to to Islam and participated to the Ottoman effort. Um, so this made the Ottomans quite mixed force at the beginning. Um, they had like all the the complete pack of the time. There's nothing really special about it. Uh, heavy cavalry. Uh, then a majority, as, a, as the core like of the shock force, then a substantially large amount of lighter equipment. Many of these peoples, again, were of the most different origins. Uh, some were paid, especially the personal retainers. Uh, we've seen it, I made multiple videos, again, specifically on this and the army organization. Um, then there were lots of these Turkmen irregulars still roaming around. Um, these were the... Um, a kinsey that were led by single tribal religious leaders of theirs and would be in fact an important part of the later Ottoman army as well. There were the Azats, for example, irregulars um, uh, and other instead regular forces uh, paid through uh, either land grants or proper money uh, fiefs, the Yaya Right, and so um, these were, interestingly enough, together with the Janissaries, infantry forces. So something that the Ottomans will become sort of famous for, and especially for the establishment of a more centralized power, probably a sultanial state, um, uh, that was, um, in fact, also competitive towards the historical, traditional feudal aristocracy, as, as we've seen in, with the um, with the sea pies uh, in, in a video about them were really just very opposite anthropologically and uh, culturally to elements like the Janissaries and other 
novelties of people fighting on foot. Let's pass briefly to the panoplistic evidence of, uh, let's start from, from the, the Byzantine influence, that is sort of the most obvious that you would think, that we pass to the Western European one. Um, so there is a fragment of gilded glass preserved at the British Museum. Uh, it's dated to the 12th century. Right? It comes from the Sultanate of Rome. That is the typical expression of, of the, the local melting pot between Turks and Byzantines. All right? So the horse archer depicted is just by general style supposed to be a, a Turk, right? But the artistry is fundamentally Byzantine in nature. The guy wears what is apparently an oven tail and long hair trailing down his back. The latter seems to be probably an Asiatic uh, Seljuk fashion of sort, which reinforces the idea that he's a Turk. However, the um, artist depicted the guy using a finger draw rather than the thumb one, which thus makes him much more European than Turkish. The um, just uh, the rose type could, of course, be mastered by both ethnicities, but tendentially, like when these representations were um, were created, like th there was normally a, an intention to stylize, to identify in a certain direction or another. Here, instead, you see that there is a lot of blend. Like, the guy is likely a Turk um, anyway, but there are these... Um, European elements. And we have a wall painting from the El Mali Ecclesia of Goreme in the province of Nefser in Turkey. This uh, dates to the last decade of the 12th century and there are many, this is a Christ Christian art, but the interesting aspect of this all is that of course there were Christian communities um, I think when, without saying under the Muslims in Anatolia, and also quite uh, florid ones, judging from first the, this art and the general data that we know about uh, the situation. Um, we um, the we do not know exactly, however, who painted these, or or at least in this location exactly who was ruling. If the the Muslim Seljuks or the Danish Mandits or the Christian Chilean Armenians, um, what is clear is that of course in this area Christian art was dominantly Byzantine in style, which follows also for the overall panoply depicted. We see, however, documentary sources describing 12th century, at least, parts of Seljuk armament very similar to the one of their Byzantine enemies. Which makes us think that, of course, in many ways, the pictures of uh, the Malik Elise, as Byzantines as, as they are in style, actually depict some realistic aspect, let's say, of certain types of armor that would have regularly been used by the same Seljuks to some extent. For example, the long-sleeved male hauberk or male shows. These were characteristic of, as you know, late 12th century European armor. Uh, we see the gaiters of a similar form of those seen in 10th, 11th century Persian art, which uh, of course, is always a thing, like the Byzantines themselves were influenced by uh, Iran and, and vice versa. The only sort of characteristically Islamic uh, item appearing here is the fact that the name of Allah is partially written on the right gator of one of the, again, of fact, the, the, the Islamic guys represent here. We have 
uh, representation of the road to the Calvary and a wall painting from Tsarikli, Kilise, still at Goreme. This dates to the second half of the 12th century. There is some controversy regarding the dating. Actually, some people say that it may be also from the century before. Um, this doesn't matter uh, too much if, unless you consider, of course, the uh, say the, the synchronous between Byzantine and um, Seljuk military styles that could have occurred even as early as the previous century. For example, we see a long-sleeved male hauberk extending beneath a skirt and a very large kite-shaped shield, right? which actually is the reason why we think that um, this uh, wall painting dates to the second half of, of the 12th century. But this type of equipment was, again, surely used by the Turks uh, as well. And again, I, I talk this extensively in the video about Eurasian steppes warfare, so if you're interested specifically in that, check check that out and remember which episode. But especially for the Khazars, you realize that already mail was much more common, especially in, in this sort of Byzantine art, domin say, documented, dominated areas. Um, the, the, the heroic, the scale of the classical times of the day of the, of the martyrs, let's say. We see from a coin of Giat al-Din Kai Pursu II, uh, from the Sultanate of Rum, we are 1243-44, this, this is preserved at the British Museum, um, a long stirrup, but not a straight leg, right? This is fascinating because normally, like steps influence people's head, the short stirrup and consequently also the straight leg, this had to do with the general habit of sort of lighter cavalry, a crouched position and horseback to even become smaller, to become, be a smaller target. You, if, you, if you are lighter, you have less armor, there is more arrows around. So um, this was also just an ethnic distinction sometimes for these heavier uh, horsemen, of course, was not too important, but still, like, this, this depiction is, is fascinating. The, uh, the leader holds a winged mace which is also like the mace is very uh, like step like but um, the wings are sort of you know developing for greater amount of armor that you see similarly also to, to Europe um, developing um, there is also what it seems uh, numismatic iconography is not that clear but Typically Turkish sharbush. This was important also for identification, just for status um, and so on. At the Karanlik Kilise of Görheme, we have yet another wall painting dated to the first half of the 13th century. This is also from the Anatolian Seljuk uh, period. And there is some interesting uh, armor which is slightly. Uh, well, not outdated, but it could be from the late 12th um, century, as early as that at least. Um, there is an interesting short-sleeved male shirt under a lamellar cuirass. Um, no other defenses are shown. Normally, you would see leather strips or splints or sort. There is none of that. Um, the male coif are interesting. There are different... Uh, figures here. Um, one wears it beneath a decorated conical helmet. Another one seems to overlap the edge of the wearer's clock, which means that it's basically a separate quaff and it looks pretty much like the Islamic Megfar one. You find male shows to an important degree of, uh, so probably of anti cavalry sort of infantry capacity. As we've seen, this area was sort of more, again, endowed with uh, mm, foot, but it's not even a urban potential, but just like the, the historical local infantry base force, or at least uh, even if cavalry was dominant, even among the Byzantines, it was 
an important degree of infantry and uh, this could be could require of course um, an anti-cavalry um, so, um, a, a protection for the cavalry against it because people say always ah you know um, missile say armor developed mostly because of missile fire what about simple spears or you know um, there is no doubt that uh, armor is useful to protect from missiles but what about any other hit for that matter and how gradually it evolves like you can't gnostically separate uh, the two things there is a, a large overall shield uh, we think for infantry use which uh, is interesting because this frontier is still at uh, least had been historically the one against um, also some more eastern missile type of enemies like the ones that had broken through after massacred and we find large um, shields uh, designs for you know the Eastern Europe, the Balkans, but we somehow forget that also Anatolia, that is so a bit more Western in nature, may have had this sort of interesting designs. There were peoples, remember, that came from Eastern Europe fighting there. So Slavs typically would have this larger, not oval shields, but I mean some of them would be, but still mostly the it's the width that that matters. They are covering the larger amount of surface as possible for any projectile. There is a um, broad, straight, and non-tapering sword, which looks pretty much Byzantine. From the carved reliefs from Konya, preserved at the Museum of Turkish Art of Constantinople, not Istanbul, of course, uh, that's my thing on Schwarzburg, as you know, dating to the 13th century, we can observe some interesting Byzantine influences also. Um, Iranian ones or even Mesopotamian ones dating to the 13th century uh, overall because we see contemporary um, evidence of the same helmets with small nozzles right um, probably made out of an integral bulb plus what looks like an almond tail which however is not homogeneous with the rest of armor and in Byzantine and Balkan iconography we find some pendant lamellar uh, which may do for that right and it is really not so strange where lots of uh, almond tails were not really in line with the rest of armor say male with lamellar for example um, or vice versa um, we see apparently short-sleeved armor worn by the, the figures displayed but also some lamellar there is a relevant uniformity overall um, chest and sleeve panels uh, we see short sleeve male shirts or albergs um, that in Byzantine art are similar to these like for the other churches of Cappadocia uh, for which we think that actually male was again probably more widespread than we think aside from the artistic license we see short straight non tapering swords this look more arab than the nails we see round small um handheld shields which are sort of more typical for eastern warfare especially for the elite um for in part the the reasons we were saying before like those heavier uh, equipment including the more say mm, a longer shaped shield even though at this point by the 13th century was becoming small in the west um, were less needed in a world where uh, if you were elite um, against a lot of missile you would mostly cover yourself in armor and that makes the shield even less uh, necessary and because infantry on average was not that strong in any case um, this wall picture is um, does display some Western influence. For example, the short skirts and ankle-length shoes of the infantrymen, right? And again, there is just some general uh, general touch of external influence you can realize from within the same land. 
Here is the astrological manuscript by Nazir al-Din al-Sivazi, a famous source. This was made for Kai Kursur III, um, dating to 1272. We're in the uh, Anatolian Seljuk Sultanate. This is at the mm. um, National Library of Paris, uh, and it uh, depicts different mythological figures, right? And this um, manuscript is particularly rare, like all sort of pre-Ottoman uh, ones are, especially in Anatolia. Um, there is a marked Persian influence. At the Museum of the Court of Arts of Konya, there is a ceramic tile uh, from the local citadel dating to the 13th century. And interestingly enough, there is uh, the depiction of a doom or conical helmet with a decorative finial, a brow plate, and a neck cloth or helm tail. Because, say, neck uh, protection could be also uh, softer, like pad. And um, this is interesting because it's very common to some helmets that are showed in late 13th or early 14th century Byzantine art. Now let's pass actually to the Western European influence um, in Seljuk Anatolia, because that's really telling. Um, at the National Library of Paris in the Cabinet de Medaille, we have a coin of Kiliyerslan Davud, that was a Seljuk Sultan of Rum. Uh, the years here are 1092 1106, so it's pretty early in time, right? And it shows, in fact, much more Byzantine influence than Seljuk one. One of the reasons, numismatically, is that, of course, the Seljuks, like the Nanish Manits, for example, wanted to be accepted, recognized by the local community, so if they depicted themselves a bit as Byzantines, and uh, not just because of the culture, but because objectively the Byzantine Empire was still a much bigger thing than the Sultanate of Rome, um, this would render them more acceptable and sort of come participating to this great universal power. The, the ambiguity there of being within the empire, for example, is quite uh, seductive because yes, these were Muslims within the Dar al Islam, but you know, wasn't this properly the land of the Romans? So, uh, what does this mean? In any case, in this uh, on this coin, we see a horseman carrying uh, quite clearly, by the way, uh, a lax in the European couche style, right? And he also rides in a straight leg position, which is very, very western, right? The only non western thing is the um, is the second blade on the butt of the legs, which was not really, you know, a thing again in Western Europe at the time, sort of Sauroter, right? Um, but for the rest, uh, you see this guy renouncing even to some, uh, like we were saying before, short um, stirrup, uh, bent leg, sort of Turkic way of war, iconically. Have another coin, this time from the Danish manded ruler of Sivas. Um, we are in the early 12th century. This is preserved in the same cabinet de medaille. This coin is less Byzantine, but it also shows a much more distinctively Western European character that is a straight tapering sword wielded by the, the horseman. Uh, the only, say, detail that is not in line with Western Europeanness is the lack of Quillon. But, uh, as you know, the straight tapering sport is a pretty Western thing. It was designed to probably be more effective against, um, against armor, both by slashing and uh, thrusting. The tapering sport, in that sense, we've seen it recently in the video about Northern France. Northern French warfare from the same period is just like the the mark of westernness. That's a place where 
In fact, there is, in absolute terms, more armor and swords have to, rather than just trying to cause damage by cutting, also they, they must also by thrusting in the, um, you know, in the, probably in the joints of the armor, trying to break uh, somehow. Then at the uh, Museum of Turkish Art of Constantinople, um, in uh, Romania, uh, we have a, a stucco relief um, of Itz al-Din Kil uh, the uh, third, that was the ruler of Rome during the 11, 1156-1188. Um, he could have been actually uh, also another historical figure, that he is Rukun al-Din Kilirsland IV, this lived almost a century later, between 1257 and uh, 1267. So there is a bit of debate because naturally the sources can be quite crude uh, in a way, right? There is no certainty which ruler, ruler this is. The, the difference in time is relevant. Um, in any case, um, the typically Seljuk, Turkish, Sharpush, fur hat um, is something more archaic in nature. Uh, one sword looks very European, which would make it in, by trend more of a later thing, but actually the westernization of Anatolian Seljuk warfare had started significantly already um, during the 12th century. Then there is another weapon which is a bit less clear, which is an incredibly exaggerated tapering uh, shape um, sword. Um, there is a mace apparently into a horseman's belt. So again, different. I mean, artistical license to, to some extent, but they mean something, and you gotta interpret that. And the Cabinet de Medaille at the uh, National Library of Paris, we have a coin of, of Rukun Aldin Kilirsland fort ruler uh, of Rome during between the 12, 1257 1267 there are some mixes here um, even contradictory to some degree a broader double headed hunting arrow which is very central Asian and may have stemmed from there uh, through, the, through the Turks and uh, and or as an archive or, or, or whatever but there is um, uh, an hypothesis proposed by Lindner which would identify in this arrow a symbol of Mongol power delegation that is to say this arrow was like if you receive it you accept it you know that the idea of the bundle is like the Roman fascus, right? It's just the, the idea that, that King Khan also showing, being shown by his mother that a bundle of arrows does not bring, while well, can break uh, an individual arrow at a time. So this arrow symbolized being part of the bundle, so of Mongol uh, subjection of some sort. A horseman um, on this coin um, rides a, with a very straight leg, which makes it very western looking, especially considering the saddle, which has a distinctly raised pommel and cannel, which is again very typical of Frankish warfare in many ways. We have an embossed ceramic vase coming from either Anatolia or western Iran from the 13th century. It should be preserved at the National Museum of Damascus, but you know, in Syria, I think strange things happen, especially in museums. Um, there are some horrifying stories um, about several, I mean, millennia old stuff that is preserved in museums um, that are completely open, people can enter and pick like old stuff from, I don't know, the early Mesopotamian civilizations that have not been studied or even cataloged yet that are left there like in a warehouse right abandoned and 
terrifying source. In any case, um, this um, this vase, as we've seen, we don't even know where it comes from. There are uh, it, from this broader Western mashrek for sure, but there are some Western characteristics, um, and one of these most obviously is um, the curb bit with a crossbar, which is something that the Mongols in Iran at the time they had already conquered it did not really have. Swords are straight and tapering. It ha they have distinct pommels, and one has a langet with uh, with an Islamic form down the blade. So it's a mix. Finally, we have a helmet dedicated to the Sultan Orkan. So we are in the early Ottoman era, uh, dating to 1326-60. It's preserved at the Askari Munza, number 15723, uh, Constantinople. Um, and this is a silver steel helmet probably one of the earliest surviving form of the so-called turban helmet which would become also s sort of typical of the Ottomans in the following generations so essentially they were larger helmets than normal which were worn over some kind of headgear um, similar to the European arming, uh, arming cap and the, the Mamluks in Egypt would also use them at some point. Again, they would become pretty famous. And we have the first be the beginnings here. Finally, I would just like to point a couple of examples of Mongol influence that was a big deal. In those videos, I don't really you know cover everything coverable, but uh, just sort of the most uh, uh, you know. Uh, exemplificative like sort of iconic ones because otherwise we don't even have a, a real statistic unit at least to a meaningful, meaningful extent. There is um, a relief carving preserved at the Inseminare Museum in Konya. This dates to the late 13th century, it comes from the Sultanate of Iconia, and it shows Fundamentally, uh, in spite of the heavy damage, the curved hilt of, of a sword and the weapon may have been itself a bit curved. And you know that sabers were pretty much Mongol and that, as we've seen here, even with Western influence, there were, uh, say, straight blades. The, the Iranian tradition was mostly about the straight blade and um, this is yet another topic I cover in the Eurasian Steps Warfare videos. And so, again, from the 13th century we start seeing more of these curved swords more, more habitually, and we can impute that to the, to, the, to the Mongols. Then at the Kremlin Armory of Moscow we have a matching pair of helmets um, that uh, can... we don't... Mm, we do not know exactly where they... they uh, they come from. Um, maybe Turkey, that's why we're mentioning it here. Um, Western Persia, or even just the Western Eurasian steppes in general. The dating is also quite difficult because uh, they're very, you know, again, there is not much of a great distinction one can make. It can be the 14th, the 15th century. In any case, it uh, rather than showing like a, M a Mongol influence, it um, uh, presents like a Turkic nomadic one because of the anthropomorphic style of visor, which was typical of the Pechenegs. I made a video about the Western steppe cavalrymen uh, on average, and some people say that the Pechenegs had already the visor helmet, which was some sort of mark of their style. Others say that they actually took it from the Mongols. And this contact may have easily have happened in Central Asia even before the so-called Mongol invasions. So we do not really know, um, but it shows how you know far and wide. In fact, these types of helmets could be found, including in Anatolia during this time. 
So as you've seen, there is actually a very important range of influences. It's not radical, but it's still uh, exemplificative of a an important, uh, let's say, characterization of Anatolian warfare in spite of the relative power, power vacuum that in spite of the Sultanate of economy like existed in the region after all. And so, um, again, a crossroad, uh, um, a center from which different uh, mercenaries could even go into different directions that, you know, among, mm, say, a politically fragmented reality that sort of accepted um, fluidity of the situation at this time between the Byzantines, the Armenians, the, um, the, say the, the, the various Egyptian-based powers, at least, and their concurrency even with the Mesopotamian ones, Caucasus, the Mongols later, a total mess. And um, the Crusaders, naturally. Uh, so uh, the, the politics of the region is extremely complicated, much more than one, aside from the basic sort of alliances, directions, like may not, uh, in fact, uh, simply guess. We, we have to make more videos about these areas. In fact, I, I begin a bit with these basic ones so that one has kind of a general idea of what we're talking about. Um, so there is a level of primitiveness after Manzikert than um, some sort of development in 13th century um, uh, with a peak fundamentally uh, of, uh, of the same you know, sultanate power. And fundamentally uh, there is also um, um, you know, a, a general um, let's say opportunity, right, for for these powers to find themselves in the condition of getting like the best from different cultural influences, showing them even sometimes just out of out of um, basic um, you know political purpose, right, and uh, as such. Uh, like the iconography must be examined uh, with all the proper caution, but also showing this degree of um, variety that is definitely very, um, uh, very telling. Like you don't find it so um, in so different directions, or it's in, in so many different directions at a time in other regions, right? So again. This video uh, and the ones I make from this series do not have the presumption, let's say, of completeness, but they can help understanding essentially more through the absence, uh, even more than the presence of certain features, what what was going on in these places and how everything could be motivated by some sort of logical um, uh, reason connected with probably the military cultures of uh, in operating in the region, All right? So we'll keep talking also about the surroundings uh, for today. However, stop it here. I just hope that you enjoy this video. If you did, please share it. Otherwise, leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content. As always, I thank you heartily for listening to me. I wish you a nice time and see you next time. Bye.